the question now becomes, what is the value? If the value is always the price that the buyer and seller agree to, why are they even having you and I go out <laughs> and put appraisal on the property? Right? Well, and I would say I would say that some real estate agents would ask that and sincerely ask that very question. Why do we have to have an appraisal when we have a willing buyer, we have a willing seller? It's obviously worth what they've agreed to. Originating from deep inside the Rocky Mountains, transported through the power of the internet, and arriving inside your tiny earbuds. It's the Appraiser Coach Podcast, helping appraisers increase their efficiency, quality, and make more money. Here's the guy who makes it his life's mission to create value for real estate appraisers nationwide. Your host and the Appraiser Coach, Dustin Harris. Welcome to the program, everybody. Dustin Harris hanging out once again with you in the podcast here. Got a great, exciting topic for you today and two really exciting guests uh, on at the same time. Going to introduce you to them in just a minute. First of all, I want to remind you, of course, we are sponsored by Elamode. Elamode is the software uh, that I have been using for years and years and years, and there's a reason. And every year, honestly, folks, I take a look at it, I evaluate it, I reevaluate it, and I keep sticking with Elamode. Uh, they keep uh, serving me well. Check them out. Go to alamode.com for more information. You can pick up the phone and call them at 800 Alamode. Working RE, of course, is where I go to uh, get a lot of the information about what's going on in the appraisal world. Uh, David and Isaac over there at Working RE very much care about uh, this profession. If you care about this profession, check them out. Go to www.workingre.com and sign up for their free F-R-E-E -E newsletter. It's workingre.com. Finally, we are sponsored by Data Master. Data Master USA.com is where you need to go to find out more about not just the first versions of Data Master, but Data Master 6, which is rolling out across the country right now. Check it out, datamasterusa.com. One more time, it's datamasterusa.com. I want to welcome to the back, uh, back to the program, first of all, Mr. Tim Anderson. Mr. Tim Anderson is a USPATH instructor. He is an MAI. He is a consultant for appraisers. Uh, he does that for hire, helps them, of course, uh, when they get in trouble with their state boards. And uh, also, if you have USPAP questions, he can reach, uh, be reached at Tim at the usepathexpert.com. Welcome back to the program, Tim. Hi, Dustin. Thank you. It's great to be with you. I appreciate the invitation. And uh, love modern technology where we're able to uh, triangulate, if you will, from all across the country. Uh, coming from a much warmer climate uh, than mine, not just uh, Tim in Florida, but uh, also Craig in southern Utah. This is Craig Morley. He is uh, part of the Acuity Group. He is part of the... Uh, are you are you still on the board of the NAA, Craig? I'm actually the president this year. Oh, well, I knew, that, I knew that was coming, but I didn't know if that had actually happened yet. Yeah, that has happened. Okay. <laughs> and I'm also serving as the vice chair of the uh, Real Property Evaluation Committee for the National Association of Realtors. So. I love it. I love it. Well, and, and I see, uh, I follow you on Facebook and you're busy working for appraisers. Craig is a certified general appraiser in uh, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. Uh, and of course, he sat on the Utah appraisal board for eight years. He chaired it for four. And he's still a nice enough guy to uh, to come on the program, even after all those years on the state board. Craig, welcome back. Yeah, that, that sometimes isn't always the uh, most uh, winning endorsement for people who have uh, sat in one of those board meetings. I hear you. I hear you. But my friend, you know, you, you've always been kind to me, and I appreciate our friendship, and I appreciate you being on today, because I think this is an important topic, folks. We're going to be talking about something that's one of those, uh, I'm going to actually label this, guys, as, as one of those third rail topics, meaning uh, it's one of those things that uh, appraisers, I think, deal with on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, but sometimes we're a little bit afraid to talk about it. And uh, so I'm, I'm grateful that you guys have come on uh, to talk. Uh, let's start this out by how it started for me. I got an email uh, in the last couple of weeks from, uh, from Mr. Tim Anderson. He sent me an email. He said, uh, check out this article that Craig Morley wrote, and uh, I opened it up. I was fascinated. I love your language. I love the way that you put this forth. I love the fact that it was concise. The brevity was the soul of wit in this, but uh, some very important topics. Topic on the table, guys, is should purchase price influence value? 
Okay, should purchase price on a, on a, let's say it's the subject that you're appraising, of course, should that purchase price, that purchase sale contract influence value? Tim, I want to start with you. Why did you send me this article? Why did you find this interesting? Well, Dustin, we're in a situation where a lot of appraisers think that when we get a copy of the contract, we are being given a target to, to hit. The, the client is saying, "Look, appraiser, here. This is where the this is where the minds of the buyer and the seller met. And if you like getting work from us, you're going to agree with the number mm. at, at which the, the minds of the buyer and the seller met. And most assuredly, it is an interesting." point of reference it is a data point to analyze but in and of itself it's just another data point okay. it's not a target to hit it is not a goal to meet it is another data point to analyze and i think we're going to get uh, more into this uh, as we talk here but you mentioned something uh, tim that uh, uh you know there's there's maybe this unspoken i would say def definitely unwritten um idea that, hey, appraiser, if you want business from me in the future, that you're going to hit this uh, purchase price. Again, I don't I don't see many people, although pre-2008, I saw a lot of it, um, where they, they flat out said it, and uh, I, don't, I don't see that as much anymore. Craig, talk to me about why you wrote this article. Why did you find this an important topic? Well, maybe a little bit of background. Uh, not too long ago, we had an interview with a regional bank, and the chief appraiser from that bank was not altogether that complimentary of appraisers, mm. which was a little disconcerting to me. And he basically told us in our meeting, and we had four or five of the appraisers in our office meeting, we were looking to start doing a little bit more of uh, some commercial work for them. And they had some odd or, or different, at least, assignment requirements. And in the conversation, he basically said, listen, if you don't appraise this for the purchase price, there's something wrong. Hmm. And uh, ironically, it wasn't too long after that, that we had an assignment where a property had been sold, was put under contract, the appraisal was completed. We thought it was probably a little below market on the purchase price. And lo and behold, that sale fell out and it resold it again at a slightly higher price. Mm -hmm. And so the question now becomes, what is the value? If the value is always the price that the buyer and seller agree to, why are they even having you and I go out <laughs> and put appraisal on the property? Right? Well, and I would say, I would say that some real estate agents would ask that and sincerely ask that very question. Why do we have to have an appraisal when we have a willing buyer, we have a willing seller, it's obviously worth what they've agreed to. Yeah, and, and that's I, I, there's probably not an appraiser alive who hasn't had that conversation with somebody, particularly if you think it's a little different than what the purchase agreement was. Okay, Tim, let's talk use Pat for just a second. The question on the table is, does the purchase price, the purchase agreement, influence value? What do you think from a use Pat standpoint, Tim? Well, standard rule 1-5, Dustin, says that the appraiser will at least ask for a copy of the purchase and sale agreement. And then assuming the uh, client is willing to uh, give a, a copy, which the client doesn't have to do, then uh, standard rule 1-5 expects the appraiser to analyze it. Mm -hmm. And of course, in this particular context, to analyze it means look at it as any other comparable sale. Because let's face it, that's exactly what it is. It's a comparable sale. It's a comparable sale of the subject. Therefore, there really shouldn't have to be any adjustments to it. So it should give a good idea of what that property is worth, assuming that the transaction prior to signing the purchase and sale agreement meets the definition of market value, mm. which is not a given. Right. Therefore, that's why the appraiser analyzes it to determine if it indeed meets the definition of market value. If it does, then it's a good comparable sale. If it doesn't, it's not a good comparable sale. Then the appraiser says, okay, I think it's an arm's length transaction, but let's see how it compares to the market. Let's face it, uh, the parties can agree to, to pay more than the property's worth out of nothing more simple ignorance. So it's the appraiser's job to say, okay, I've got the purchase and sale agreement. I've got the market data. 
Now, I'm going to analyze those, and then from those, I'm going to synthesize something that never existed before, my opinion of value. And your opinion of value can be lower than the purchase price, at the purchase price, or above the purchase price. All you have to do is justify it. Right, right. Justify it, meaning uh, this is something you and I have talked about quite a bit in, in this word support, right? Right. So explain it. Support it. Here's my opinion, and here's why I think that way. So, Craig, um, and I love Tim's answer because, uh, yes, indeed, USPAP does not just ask, not just say pretty please, but require that an appraiser analyzes any current listing or any current contract uh, on the particular property that we are that we are appraising. But let's talk reality, Craig. Uh, you and I are active appraisers, and uh, there is this let's call it pressure, if you will. Maybe it's unseen, maybe it's unspoken, uh, but there is this pressure when it comes to a purchase sale contract. I mean, let's face it, no appraiser wants to come in below the purchase price. Uh, we've all been through that. We've all had the phone calls from the realtors. We've all had the angry jingling on the phone. So how does this play out in reality, Craig? Or how should it? Let's put it that way. Well, the reality is that, as Tim pointed out, it's a point of data. Mm -hmm. is something that has happened and the reality is for me and i can only speak for myself at this point but i look at it and and try to determine what were the motivations between the buyer and the seller how well informed were they when they made this purchase decision was there additional inventory out there uh, you know occasionally you'll get in and look at these things and say well why didn't you buy the house down the street that was less money Right. And then you start to investigate that and find out that, well, there's a material difference. And it, unless you've got a, a stupid buyer and who hasn't looked at any of the inventory, they, they might have seen more of the properties and be more familiar with what's out there than you or I might be. And so the well, reality true. is you have to look at that and reconcile. Why would a rational, sane person be willing to pay this price? And I think as Tim talks about uh, in supporting your opinion, that that's part of what we're doing. We're going in and looking at the conditions associated with that transaction and determine if it's consistent with the market or not. When we come back from the break, I want to talk about statistics, uh, specifically how many appraiser, appraisals rather come in at or above the purchase price. But before we go to the break, just a one-word answer from both of you. Uh, Tim, I'll start with you. Same question to both of you. The question is, should the purchase price, should the contract, the current contract, influence value? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Craig? Yes. Okay. I think it should. All right. All right. Cool. We're going to explore that a little bit when we come back from the break. I want to pause here, of course, to remind you that we are sponsored by three great companies. One of them, Craig, is located in, uh, in Utah today. And He's on the southern end, but on the northern end, great little company called Data Master. Little meaning it's a family-based business. It's small as far as uh, when you call there, you'll be able to talk to a person, but big as far as their footprint and influence across the nation. This is a company that will help save you 30 to 60 minutes per report, and that's what's before Data Master 6. Folks, if you've not checked out their demo of Data Master 6, go to datamasterusa.com. Find out what you are missing. Again, it's datamasterusa.com. We are sponsored by Alamode. Alamode is the company that I keep going to. Uh, not only do I want Alamode on my Pi, but I also want Alamode as my software for appraisal. It is an amazing software package. It allows me to be able to do more and thus it is an investment in my business. I'm all about efficiencies, I'm all about technology. If you have not checked out Alamode recently and some of the changes that they have made, specifically to the mobile version, folks, if you wanna save time and have higher quality reports, you need to check out Alamode. Call them at 800 Alamode or you can pick up your laptop and type in www.alamode.com. Finally, we are sponsored by Working RE Magazine, Working RE keeps me informed as to what's going on in the appraisal profession. Lots of changes, folks, over the last several months, several years, and more changes into the future. If you want to know what's going on with your particular career, with your particular industry, check them out. Go to Working RE as in Working Real Estate. Again, it's WorkingRE.com.
right, folks, welcome back. We are joined today by Craig Morley out of uh, Southern Utah. Uh, Craig is with the Acuity Group, and uh, he is also the president of NAA. He is an, a, an appraiser, a certified general in uh, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. Uh, he also sat on the state board in Utah for eight years. Welcome back to the program, Craig. Appreciate you being with us today. Always a pleasure, Dustin. Thank you. And of course, Tim Anderson, a frequent guest here on the program, a great guy. Very smart, USPAP instructor, MAI, and uh, consultant for appraisers. Uh, welcome back to the program, Jim. Thank you, Dustin. I also do windows. <laughs> I'll have to call you. We're talking today about purchase price, and we're talking about this third rail, if you will, this unspoken idea that if I don't come in at purchase price, there's going to be a problem. Let's talk statistics. Uh, Tim, I know you and I have talked these before. Tell me what the stats show us regarding appraisals and purchase price. Well, data going back to the 80s, uh, and the original uh, study was done on the FHA properties, show that over 90% of appraisals would come in at or above the purchase and sale agreement price, and 95% of, 95 of appraisals come in within 1% of it. Hmm. So. Now, obviously, there are going to be some uh, contracts where the appraiser analyzes it, says, oh, yeah, okay, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer and Seller know what they're doing. Okay, yeah, this is this indeed, the contract purchase price is indeed the market value of the property. But it would be kind of uh, silly as well as naive to assume that's true 100% of the time. Therefore, the question comes up, are appraisers using the purchase and sale agreement as a goal, as a target, and it appears that, yes, some of them are. Let me play devil's advocate a little bit with you, Craig. Um, I've heard that stat before. 90% of appraisals come in at or above purchase price, and some people might slap their cheeks and, and, and their mouth might go real big and they think, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it. Of course, there's something fishy going on here. Of course, there's other things that play into this. Tim pointed out one of them. If, you, you know, if you've read Wealth of Nations and you understand the invisible hand that Adam Smith talked about years ago, that uh, you know, if the forces are working, supply and demand uh, in, in a typical marketplace, you would expect that most purchase contracts would be at or similar to of course, uh, the uh, the value, if you will, or, or what the market could support. There's also the argument, uh, I've heard Ernie, Ernie Durbin make this argument, that, uh, well, you know, if you look at the stats, remember, we're getting those past what actually happened, the action, if you will. In other words, how often do we come in at, quote, unquote, below contract, and all of a sudden that contract drops? So, yeah, if I came in at 195000 and the purchase price was 200000 is it possible that they will now lower that and it will sell for one ninety five, and thus magically my appraisal comes in at or above purchase price where it didn't a couple of days earlier, right? So there's that influence as well. But let's face it, there is pressure on appraisers, of course, to quote unquote make contract price. There's a lot of kickback that we uh, that we don't have. So let's talk about this difference, Craig, between analysis, okay, that's what we're required to do on USPAP versus influence. So I think the reality is, is that uh, the question I guess you could ask yourself is do comparable sales influence you on developing the opinion of value? And I hope it does, because that is the principle of substitution is the foundation upon which the sales comparison approach is built. Mm -hmm. And so one single sale for most appraisers isn't going to set the target for what the property's worth, but is certainly going to influence your thinking. And likewise, I think with the subject, it, it's certainly not going to set the target or, or the price for the property, but it certainly ought to influence your thinking to the extent that you sit down and have a, a, a good analysis that says, was it exposed to the market for an adequate period of time? Mm -hmm. Were the buyer and the seller typically motivated and did they have adequate information to make a rational purchase decision? And do the terms of this agreement represent a cash equivalent transaction? When we don't have those circumstances occur, then it's likely that the contract price might be inconsistent with the market value based on other transactions in the area. But it's certainly, I, I really kind of see us as the appraiser as being the gatekeeper that kind of helps make sure that you don't get some of this fraudulent stuff taking place. 
I, I can recall, and I know Dustin used and had seen this as well, but I recall when we were in the battle days in 2005 and six and seven, where we were <laughs> getting a lot of this. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> where, where, where the real estate agent was uh, picking the appraiser and they mm. were, uh, and you know, you, you would see a contract coming in and, uh, I, I remember specifically seeing several situations where a property had been listed for $795,000 two months ago, and they walk in with a contract at $1.5 million. Bucks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm doing my due diligence. I'm looking at this and say, wow, this seems kind of high. <laughs> and so I uh, start uh, doing a little research and find out, well, gee, it was listed two months ago for $795,000. I think there's a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and in that particular case, I was on the board at the time, and I think we avoided a little bit of the uh, pressure that some of the lenders were exerting because they were afraid to uh, to do that to mm -hmm. someone who, who was in a, uh, a, a position of influence. And so we, we uh, I contact the lender and say, hey, I think you've got a problem here. I explained the circumstances. They canceled the appraisal assignment. The thing I don't know is if they then contacted the next appraiser exactly. down the road to go do the deal and make it happen no, anyway. Which they, they, did. they did. They <laughs> did. Probably so. Yeah. So but, let's. But the bottom line is is we uh, uh, we haven't seen a lot of that take place since uh, the Home Valuation Code of Conduct of Dodd Frank, and so I I think in some sense just the fact that they know that there's going to be an independent third take a look at a transaction puts the fear in some of these folks to where it helps clean up the lending industry a little bit maybe a lot that uh, protects the, the consumer and the public in ways that uh, we don't often see simply because it's a preventative measure well in in uh, inadvertently you pointed out that the appraiser of course is the only third party the unbiased party in in this whole transaction and that's i guess why we feel pressure on both sides because everybody else has skin in the game right i think it's interesting uh you point out craig in your article that when you look at use path that sr1-5 is the fifth step in the overall process in other words we've gone through a whole lot more till we get to that uh, tim how important is that that uh, we really should be looking at the purchase product and and i'll just be honest with you i, I play this little game sometimes in fact quite often when it comes to purchase uh, I don't like to look at the contract, even though I may have it. It may be in my work file. I didn't see it because I've got, uh, you know, uh, a great assistance at the office that accept that and put it in the work file. But a lot of times I won't even double click on that till I actually have uh, at least a window of, of value. And I want to talk about this window of value. But, Tim, how important is it that, uh, that we let this process roll out? And maybe it's not the first thing we see, but maybe the last thing that we see in this appraisal process. Dustin, because the SR1-5 is the fifth step in the appraisal process, that means that the purchase and sale agreement, if indeed there be one, should come late in the analytical process. Unfortunately, as you indicated, the lender uh, tends to send that over with the, the package of material. Sure. And then, of course, the broker calls them and says, oh, hi, Dustin, did you get the contract at $1.6 million? <laughs> so you really... And here's the comps that I want you to use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. here's the comps I want you to use, and I'll even fill out the form for you. Right, right. Just sign it. Um, <laughs> so we've got a situation where instead of not getting that information until the end of the analytical process. We get it at the beginning of the analytical process. However, if the appraiser is true to the definition of a use path's definition of an appraiser, in other words, one who is expected to provide valuation services uh, independently, impartially, and uh, forget the other one, objectively, then the uh, purchase and sale agreement should influence the purchase price, but then no more than any other comparable mm, okay. uh, influences the purchase price. And if that's the way the appraiser is handling that situation, then fine. Otherwise, then there may be an ethical problem. Yeah. I would say if I asked this question to any appraiser, would you use one comparable sale? Uh, even if it wasn't a, a requirement from Fannie Mae to have at least three, right? Would you ever use just one comparable sale? I think most of my peers would say, no, that would be foolish because who knows that data may be 
uh, misplaced. That data may be inaccurate. That may be an outlier. And to, and to base a value on one point, well, it'd be stupid. Craig, one of the comments you made at the, as you closed up your article was, uh, and I'll just uh, read from the article, it says, listen to the entire market, not merely one of its participants. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that we sometimes spend too much time focusing on these purchase transaction associated with the subject and start trying to drive everything to that point rather than to step back and look at the data in its entirety. And is the market going up or down? How good is my data set? And how recent are the sales? And what direction is it going? And let's look at the market as a whole. I think it's even a mistake sometimes to just look at the three or four sales that you might put in your appraisal. Hopefully, we're filtering through a vast assortment of data to select those that we think are most representative. But we can get a lot of really good data that helps us to determine where the market is and uh, and should shape our opinion in such a way that we can determine that this particular transaction is within the context of the market or it's not. Yeah. And this is why I think that. Yeah, exactly. I love it. Great, great sum up there. Uh, you know, it either is or it isn't. And it's our responsibility to, uh, to, to point to the market and not necessarily uh, the purchase sale agreement, which may, I think a lot of times probably is uh, due to the influences of, of how capitalism works and how the uh, law of substitution works probably is uh, in, in that realm, but it may not be. And it needs to be up to the appraiser, again, the unbiased third party to be able to stick his neck out a little bit or her neck out a little bit and, uh, and, and make that statement. Uh, I'm going to lay myself out on the altar a little bit, and I'm going to ask for both of your opinions on this. Uh, and, and you don't need to agree with me just because I'm the host of the show here. Uh, one of the things that, that I've gotten a habit of doing over the years is uh, I've noticed, and Tim, you and I have talked about this, that, that uh, honestly, the single data point, the single uh, value point uh, that we that we really come down to the nearest dollar, and really let's let's face it. I mean, we don't put put the pennies on there, but we're we're pinpointing these appraisal values to the nearest penny. We're saying this is the value. It's no more. It's no less because that's the way that the form reads. Now, when I do a private deal, I love to do a range of value because I think that's a lot more fair. The way that I look at this is I typically come up with a range of value in my work file before. Uh, obviously, that that may or may not go on the report itself, depending on what the client wants, but. The way this plays in for me is if I've got this range of value and then I look at that other data point, which may be the purchase sale agreement, and it fits within that range of value, I may lean toward that purchase price if it's within the range of value. If it's not, I think that we have a duty and obligation uh, to make that statement as well. Thoughts? Tim first and then Craig. Okay. My thoughts is stupid. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, that we are required to come up with a single point is just dumb. Mm. In, in fact, it would have to get better to ascend the stupid. Um, <laughs> and you know, Dustin, that uh, you know, I, I tend to speak in circles and you, I never say how I feel. Uh, <laughs> it's stupid. Yeah. And, uh, but yet that is something that appraisers have never pushed back on. Mm. So as a result, because appraisers have never pushed back on it, I believe we've lost the ability to push back on it. So as a result, the GSEs are going to expect uh, a number, even though uh, technically that is as misleading as hell. Hmm. But yet that's what we do. Yeah. Thank you. Craig, thoughts on the process that we do here in my appraisal office? So one of your sponsors, Alamode, has a cool little tool in their worksheet that is integrated into the data that you import into your report form. And one of the things that we've been able to do that I just love, that I think this guy is answering your question, so don't get too nervous, but uh, is that we will go in and look at our unadjusted highs, lows, means, and medians, and then look at the uh, unadjusted means and medians, highs and lows, and see how that relates to the data. And then we go in and weight the data and see what the analysis looks like. And you realistically, if I think I've got an arm's length transaction and that this is based on an informed buyer and seller and it's within my range of data, I am probably going to be inclined to say that the market value is consistent 
and that's usually the language I'm using in my reconciliation, is that the purchase agreement is consistent with the bulk of the market data that's yeah. available. Yeah. And, and, and so I concluded that that's a reasonable value. I think the range is clearly, as Tim has pointed out, he doesn't, uh, you know, he, he, he's, he's a little ambivalent whether you should have a point value or not, but I, I think uh, the range probably <laughs> makes more sense. But, uh, I but, think he used uh, the word stupid, Craig. <laughs> I don't think there's any ambivalent in there. <laughs> so I think the range makes a lot more sense. But the bottom one of the things I like to look at is after I've adjusted my sales, did my range narrow down? You know, because mm. what I'm looking to see, how tight is my range? How good is my data set? Yeah. If I've, I've, I've reviewed appraisals where the range of indicated values was higher than the appraised value. <laughs> you know, they had a, they appraised something for, a, you know, a, a $1.2 million and their range of adjusted sales was like 1.3. Yeah, yeah. And, and at that point, you start to think, well, either the sales aren't comparable or there's something wrong with the analysis. <laughs> and, and so I kind of like to hope, you know, that it's narrowing the gap a little bit that can drag me to that euphemistic point value that everybody seems to want. But, uh, but, you, you know, you, you feel like you've at least got a higher degree of confidence if I've got a fairly tight range after I've done my analysis. Um, Craig Morley, thank you for joining me today. Um, NAA, tell tell us more. How how do people? Uh, it's a great uh, organization, by the way. Uh, why why should people be interested in NAA, and how can they find out more? You know, Dustin, right now we we live in an appraisal environment that is just under attack from every every side. It seems like, and we've got about seventy percent of the appraisers in the U.S. aren't affiliated with a professional appraisal organization. The National Association of Appraisers is really designed to try to fit that gap, where the membership fees are very low. It is the lowest membership fee of any professional organization in the country. You've got national representation across the, all of the you know, major uh, players in the business. We have people attending these meetings, providing input, shaping policy. And then we work with our state organizations to help the individual states. And there's not a single organization out there that has a board of governors that works with state associations to try to help shape policy that affects the individual appraiser. And let's face it, and I, I probably told you this before, uh, Dustin, is, you know, USPAP is only what your state board thinks it is. And uh, you, you can have Tim come in and say, this is the way it ought to be, but it is your appraiser board is, are the ones that, uh, that to implement that. And if you don't have a good, reasonable set of appraisers on that board, you've got a problem. Yeah. And there's been a number of states that have had a problem. And so our focus is we want appraisers to be involved with the state association. We're prepared to help them if they'd like that. Yeah. Speaking of help, Tim, uh, if an appraiser finds themselves on the wrong side of the appraisal board, gets that letter, if you will, how can they reach you? Dustin, they can get in touch with me at Tim at theappraisersadvocate.com or my phone number is area code 561-635-5265. And if all else fails, you can get in touch with me at Tim at theuspathexpert.com. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you being on once again. Craig, thank you for joining us today. Uh, where do we find this article that we talked about today? We, we, the, the NAA has a what we call 411. It's a little uh, information blurb that we send out frequently, and, and that's where that's at. We will have it. Uh, I, I will uh, have that posted to you. It will be coming up in an upcoming version of the appraisal focus. And so we would invite, uh, it, it, otherwise, if somebody would like a copy, reach out to me. I'll, I'll send them a copy and uh, be happy to share with, uh, with them our thoughts on that. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Tim uh, and Craig, uh, great uh, men I look up to and admire, and uh, it's been a great conversation. I think uh, some, some real things were said today, and I think that's important. Thanks, uh, gentlemen, for joining us, and uh, thanks you, each of my listeners, for joining us as well. And we will catch you next time. You've been listening to the Appraiser Coach Podcast with Dustin Harris. If you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and post a short review on iTunes.
For more in-depth insider information on how you can make more money as a real estate appraiser, visit theappraisercoach.com and sign up for the All-Star Team today. Thanks for joining us. And now, get out there and create some value.